all of the ideas, all of the um, love for Aimé and the respect for his work, it's really, um, it's really very moving. And I'm also really overwhelmed by how this audience just grew and grew and grew so that we're now completely taking up two rooms, which is just really incredible and a real testament to um, Aimé's ideas and um, his power as a, as a teacher and um, uh, the love of, that we have for our colleagues. And I just want to thank all of our speakers, um, and I'm speaking on behalf of Amanda, my co-organizer, um, for coming from Detroit and from North Carolina and from Austin, Texas, and from right here and from Ann Arbor. Um, you really just opened up this book for me in all kinds of ways um, that I will remember for a very long time. Right now what I'd like to do is lead a question and answer. Um, and I know we have members of the first panel are still interspersed in the crowd, but um, feel, feel free to address questions to them as well. Comfortable questions. I, I've only just gotten my, uh, my copy, but as you were unable to disconnect yourself from AMA, I'm curious to know if you gave thought to the idea that you were analyzing a book by someone you loved personally very much, and were you able to give it the analysis you would have otherwise given that other book you had just received from your colleague that ended up on the, on the bookshelf. I'm curious to know what thought you gave that as you were, as you were reading the book. Um, whether you just didn't try to disconnect yourself or what you gave it that thought. Well, I, I also couldn't separate myself from the original from the original readings of the book as the dissertation advisor. So I did have pencil in hand. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, to respond to the question, let me add some clarity. The reason why we often put our colleagues' books on the shelf is because we've got about 50 other books that we have to read and we'll get to them eventually. <laughs> so given the importance of this panel, um, it, it took priority. Um, there are some moments in the book that I wished that Aimé could communicate something to me verbally at the time. I watched the D'Angelo video again, and I envisioned myself sitting down with him saying, well, I might not have seen the same thing you did convince me more. So I think that, you know, thinking critically is what we always do. Um, and I think what it does, at least for me, is that it helped me really understand the intellectual workings of a colleague that I usually would interact with on the social level or in African American studies meetings that would expose a different side of him. So this just demonstrates the importance of reading colleagues' works um, to learn as much to offer insight and so-called criticism. I, I like to, I'll the question was, well I like to respond to that by um, proposing a, another framing which is um, our engagement with the work, with the ideas, and our relationship to it. So it is true that because we are reading a text from our dear friend and colleague, there is that emotional um, relationship to it, which surely um, well, I potentially can um, uh, mediate your critical response. <coughs> But there's also the case, I and mean, this is equally, if not more of an offsetting, also the case that because we have this investment in it and relationship to it, and by relationship, I don't mean just our relationship to AMA, but as Barbara just, was just describing, having served as the dissertation advisor, she knows the material, knows the evolution. And so I think that relationship to it makes for a different type of engagement, such that we can understand the work more deeply than, in some ways, than, than another book you may read. So that was surely, I think, offsets if you're not able to be critical. And there are a few points that, that I'd like to mention quickly um, about my own relationship to the work. So uh, as Barbara mentioned, Frantz Fanon has mentioned several times in the text. And M.A. and I, and many others, including some in the room during our years in graduate school, um, the 1990s, when a lot of work was coming out on Frantz Fanon, were engaged from different disciplinary um, perspectives in the work of Frantz Fanon. So my reading the text, reading the book, is I'm thinking back about those conversations we had. Another is the title. I recall a mate telling me that when he was young, he would um, he learned and would recite the poem to the Blue Mess Die. And Mr. Ellis uh, confirmed that for me during the break. Um, another thing is I remember having conversations with him about Elders Cleaver and his book Soul on Ice. 
which I implored him not to do. <laughs> because I think Elder Cleaver as a person and that text are so problematic in so many ways and unrepresentative of what I understand to be a, 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 a um, more broad um, set of texts and, and ideas of the Black Power Movement that I thought that was just dangerous intellectually and, and problematic. And I told him that. Now, obviously he didn't heed. Um, but I do think that his, so, so I'm reading that chapter with, with that background, but I think that his focus on Cleaver's uh, discussion of Watts and how what it meant for black men in Los Angeles and California and, and prison um, is very perceptive. So although, so I come to that very strongly critical of what he's doing. If I didn't know this person, I read that chapter, I wouldn't be able to see, it would be hard for me to see what's there because I have my own schemas, my own ideas about this text. But because of that relation to the material, I can now see better than I think I otherwise would the insights that he's giving me. I, I really like uh, Barbara's notion of the biographical fallacy. I think we need, we need to revive that. I think it brings up wonderful insights. Um, about this book, I had read the introduction, a draft of it, a while back, you know, Amy had shown me, but when I read the whole book, I think the totality of it was really riveting when you put all the stories together. And uh, that was really something that deeply moved me. You know, as I said, I'm not in African American studies, but the discussions that Amy and I had were always about empire, and and often differences about how the British treated Indians and how they treated Afro, you know, the Africans. And this was when we were in London, and Amy made us visit Brixton, and I made them made him go to Brick Lane, and so we, we we had this sort of ongoing. But my experience of reading the book was of other arguments I would be having with Amy as I was reading it and ask him questions. <laughs> Some of the things about the D'Angelo, which I found the most compelling chapter. I read it twice, actually. So I think, as you said, that he, we would be asking questions. Um, and, you know, so now I'm going to just ask them in my own mind. You know? <laughs> um, so I met Amy's parents at the hospital. And we were all marked by Amy's passing because we were here. And uh, it became, you know, an intense um, emotional moment for a lot of us uh, in the in the uh, English department. I mean, it's passing. You can't then read the book about a friend who died and whose and whose death you were attending to uh, without that marking how you read the book itself. Maybe you could see then when I was making my remarks that about the two pronged uh, engagement with death that this book made for me. Obviously, I could not separate that from the continual referencing in the back of my head about the passing of MA. And, 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 and what I really want to say is, in some sense, that, that uh, way in which we face the encounter with death is crucial for all of us, you know, on many levels. And, and I drew a lot from the book about the necessity, how we think about um, that, ne that necessity for ourselves. I don't just think it's because I'm older, I think it's because it's fundamental to all of us as human beings that we must confront that, the meaning of what it is uh, to face the moment of death. So yeah, personal, biographical, you bet, that really heavily marked my reactions, my responses to, to, the, uh, to the book. Um, I have a bit of a different um, experience. Um, first, as his student, and seeing some of the texts that he had us read in class and the text that he put on my comps list and um, looking at the way in which he used it and the way in which I employed them. But also thinking about my personal friendship with him. And I remember, um, as Ken just talked about, like, you know, everyone ha had an experience with, um, I remember that summer, when he told me he was sick and, um, and he told me he was on borrowed time, something to that effect, right? And then we, we proceeded to talk about death because I lost my brother a year before he lost Ian. So we had this connection about, we, we had talked about death already. And so our orientation towards death and the way we thought about it was already, we had already talked about this. And we actually had that discussion Steve, that you talked about, like, how do you make sense? And he sort of, and I remember him saying, um, you know, I'm writing about this. 
and I'm sort of faced with this. And he's, it was, oh, we talked about this bi biographical fallacy. Like he talked about it. And so as I read, and I told him that we had different sorts of spiritual leanings. So my envisioning and the way I dealt with my brother's death was the notion that, or is, is my orientation that my brother's still with me, right? And so, and I, I would talk about this with Amy. And so I told him how I lit candles, and this is this is my way of dealing with and invoking spirit, right? And and I found it interesting, and I saw I saw him talk about spirit, and at some point I don't remember the chapter, and I was surprised because of his spiritual orientation, and we sort of kind of debated, and he thought he was fascinated with the way I, I approached it, and so as I read it, it wasn't sad for me because it was more exciting, like I felt like I was engaging with Amy. And sure, I had questions, and I almost like imagined myself, like we had this, when I would get my moments and I would sort of battle with him, like I was courageous to battle with him. <laughs> um, but he encouraged that, right? And so, and, and I wanted to ask him, well, what about this? Don't you think you're stretching that a little bit far? And that was my dialogue as I was reading it. So. It, as bittersweet as it was, for me, it was sort of like, oh, and Amy's back, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. um, and that's, and that, and that has to do with my world view, right, so. As I was reading this work, I was, um, one of the uh, questions that I, that I had as I was reading is how, you know, how white men's ideas have transference into my own work, uh, into my own research, into my own empirical research, into um, the literacy lives of black college males. And so um, that was probably one of the, uh, the biggest struggles that I had, you know, and like what, and so I was asking this, this question as well, how I would make this, how, how can this study be more compelling, right, if, um, MA were to actually have conversed with, you know, uh, black males, right, that he uh, sort of talks about in his book, right, um, and what might he have, you know, what kind of understandings might he have gained had he um, interacted with, I don't know, say some young black men, right, some from Detroit or from these urban landscapes that he speaks about in his book, understanding, um, to, to his ideas, right? Um, and so, yeah, I think that was probably the biggest for me, you know, because I'm always trying to think about these things in real world terms, in terms of like, you know, what does, so for example, what might, you know, these death narratives look like in the everyday lives of young black males that I, I mentor, that I teach, you know, that come through higher education, you know, and are dealing with, you know, different issues you know, uh, as they articulate into higher education, you know, and, and all of these histories and experiences that they bring, you know, uh, that impact how they uh, matriculate and how they uh, think about language and literacy and, and uh, their identities uh, in spaces like, uh, like a Michigan State, right? And so that was probably my biggest question. Um,